Hello. Hello, everybody. Hello. <laughs> okay. Ah. Uh, good to see you all. Take your time if you want to see everyone. Takes a little bit of opening up. Hey. Hmm. So uh, today, just letting your attention settle within your body, within your Again, sometimes it's helpful to actively soften the heart at the beginning of a sitting as best we can. And so sometimes it's just hearing the word kindness or care, tenderness, or sacred, holy. Each breath is holy. I know sometimes I reflect on the first time I experienced loving kindness, that kind of genuine well-wishing for myself. It was on a very cold January day in Northern Maine after a snowstorm and the sun came out. And I felt that warmth of the sun and really received it. And it doesn't have to be an intense quality of attention or connection. It can be very quiet and peaceful, but it has a, a, an aspect of a shift like we're inside our skin, relating to each breath with a kind of holy attention, quiet. And we receive any kindness we can relate to ourselves with. just like a little warmth of the sun when we're cold or a warm shower. Why can some people find it helpful to put their hand on their heart center? But it has that quality of just a light touch of tenderness or care. Often there's a, just a very light feeling of relaxation 
in the mind, heart, body. Sometimes it's like we're fighting to exist. And just a few moments of friendliness or kindness unhooks that energy field. And it's like we can feel that kindness for any sounds that are happening that we can hear. And this is where the you can start seeing the how the kindness can help us be with things as they are, more acceptance. So it's this kindness toward how things are. Unpleasant, pleasant, neutral feelings coming and going with each sound. We can care about that. Kindness can allow, make space for things as they are. We can start to shift into the receiving the textures and vibrations moment to moment in the silence with the silence, which has a texture and sounds. And with our hands, sliding the attention Settle inside them. And it's just that beginning with the care. Kindness. That relaxation. of the softening of the heart. And then shifting to receiving the sensations happening right now. Not the word hand or finger our palm, those words will come and go. No need to struggle with them. We get warmer, kind with concept. But then just letting the attention sink into, connect with. whatever's appearing moment by moment, pleasant, unpleasant, or neutral.
And from the hands, it's fairly close to just shift over to the swells of the breath. Right at the abdomen. Relating as best we can with at first with care or just that quiet tenderness. Like touching the petal of a flower. So light and delicate. No need to control this movement. Just letting it come and go, just as it is. It's not me, not I, not mine. Whatever appears during the sitting can be a way of offering our connection, thoughts coming and going by themselves, to care, to be kind. They're so fast. They're trying so hard to figure everything out. We just let them be just as they are. It's like the sound of listening to a bird listening to a human. No need to get so involved with each storyline, just to see them as thoughts coming and going. Not me, not I, not mine. With emotions, body sensations, whatever appears, pleasant, unpleasant, neutral. A kind hello and goodbye.
Thank you, Michelle. This past week, I received an email <clears throat> from a like a meditation app that um, I hadn't heard of, with an invitation to um, you know offer like a talk or a practice period at some point in the next year. Um, it wasn't like a very you know they it's like an email that looks personal sort of but really you see like where your name is it's like a different font you know <laughs> all the details are in a different font but it was sort of interesting i was like oh, i'll check it you know see what this who what, what's up with all this and you know who these folks are and um it's interesting you know a lot of there's you know there's so many at this point out there and um you know all have their different or many of them have their sort of different spin on things. This one was sort of interesting. They're, they're Buddhist, you know, they kind of acknowledge that rather than just sort of in the mindfulness realm. And, and they, they're still sort of Donna kind of centric, you know, but it's, but it is in one of the questions I asked them was, you know, it is a, a private, you know, corporation. Um, and so the, you know, they give the teacher a share of, of the Donna that they have kind of, you know, portioned out. And anyway, it was just like an interesting thing to kind of like get a little more sense of kind of how some of the stuff plays out out there. And, um, and the, and the, what it evokes for me, you know, um, in different ways, but, but, you know, ultimately the, the, the very easy decision to not participate, you know, for me, it's, it's really rooted in, um, something I, I feel like is so sacred and such a refuge for, for me and for all of us, you know, in the Dhamma around, um, Something, you know, around money, around um, the relationships that we are trying to cultivate and value and the the dynamics, that, you know, that we value um, and, and the spiritual process we're trying to develop internally, you know, and um, the short of it is just, you know, the basically the feeling of... Um, of getting that that that's how it you know profit comes from paying workers less than the value they create right and and so that feeling of being exploited is something i find distasteful <laughs> uh as many do but also the feeling that you're creating or that i w am creating profit out there, the capital, right? This thing that sort of stands against us as like that, which is organizing so much of our society and that which affirms and reestablishes and enforces like private ownership, which is also something I don't believe in kind of ethically or spiritually, right? It's, it's, it's a, it's one of these places where the Buddhist teachings around non-ownership um feels like so powerful and um and so in deeply entwined with the understanding of non-self and um the liberation that we seek you know in terms of our personal liberation from the sort of formations of self and of me and mindness but also what that can mean for us you know together as a community as people as beings and um, and I know that there's many people for whom, well, teachers for whom it's like that there's not a lot of other options um, in terms of livelihood. And these platforms really are the predominant, becoming such a predominant force, you know, and, 
and yet this issue has been it's not just for the prof, for profit ones you know it's been a place of contention that i've had with other centers right around who owns what we create who owns these recordings and um i don't want to own them <laughs> but i also don't want them to be used to like work against me or work against others or to create profit for to be exploited right in that way and so this is not even what this talk is about but i want to say it's the it's the entry point <laughs> it's a point of like i want to just it is an entry point to what it talks about and to just really just say how grateful i feel and how like unfathomably fortunate that i that i feel like i'm able to survive and exist in in this way in which we are not buying and selling our offerings and that the sangha is able to support us in the ways that they can and the way that you can um the generosity you know that i've received from michelle like all these years with no expectation of of exchange you know and 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 the steven and the board and our you know dhamma family you know this sense of like what powerful experience and um and platform for insight and understanding it is to for some period of time <laughs> be able to to not have to engage these um, dynamics uh, relationships that feel really oppressive and exploitative and um, and you know they they're, they're not just that of course there's a lot of wonderful stuff out there and I, I don't mean to but there is this element of it that I feel so relieved right or or this like you know Kim being able to have offered the donation to make this app that we've created right this idea of like it's just out there you know this idea that no one does own it that it's just free and to be freely used by anyone um all these talks and instructions and teachings and um just how good that feels you know how it really feels like it could be the way the world works you know why not and so some words of appreciation and, and acknowledgement of like um, how fortunate I am, how fortunate we are, what a, good, what a good thing it is that we are doing and trying to do and trying to uphold and understand, you know, in a, uh, in a powerful way. And that it does, this understanding of it is something that means something to me. It's, it's something that I've... Um, you know, I'm always trying to dig into and, and pursue more clearly and hopefully more profoundly. And and the irony of this sense of non-ownership on one hand in the Dhamma, in the Buddhist teachings, but also this idea of action, of kama, karma, as our, the one thing we do own, right? As that we are the owners of our actions, kamasaka, you know, is the, is the refrain in uh, the metta chant that we chant together often on retreats and other programs and um, is a kind of fundamental aspect of the teaching is this sense of ownership of action and the responsibility of that and the, what is the maturity of that. And so it's, um, it's always been something that's meant a lot to me in the, in the practice and in um and in the sense of community right around relationship and right action and and the 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 ethics and the 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 force of morality in terms of our choices you know that feels so profound and powerful um but it wasn't really until last year that I, as I've been thinking about some of the stuff and trying to write about around labor and around uh, some of the dynamics, you know, I encounter in life and also in teaching of the, just the definition of kama. And what has been amazing to me is, is looking that up is that like, you know, this sense of so much of the notion of kama and karma 
that many people, at least in the West, have is around this sort of mystical quality of, um, you know, the moral implications of our actions sort of determines the kind of fate of our existence, you know. Uh, that's that's one way of sort of saying it. But that it's really understood as this kind of mystical force and mysterious and unfathomable in detail. And the Buddha even says that in places. And, and of course, there is a lot in the tradition about um, wholesome and unwholesome kama and the results of kama happening immediately or later in this life or in some future next lifetime. And, and so there is something in it that has this kind of quality of the that which is not directly observed for many of us, I'll say for myself, in terms of having to believe in notions of, um, you know, past lives or past kama and, and, you know, the complexities of that, that we get entangled of. Does that mean, you know, where people are responsible for all the unpleasantness in their lives and oppression in their lives or whatever ways you might go with it. But when you actually look at the, uh, the definition, it's really amazing that most of the ways that that word is used in Pali, and so, of course, it's going to be sort of in the canon, you know, for the most part, but that action is definitely one aspect of it, but it's really work. It's it's labor is what that word means, and it, it, it means like vocation, and um, there's something very powerful about that understanding that I think is important for all of us to, to just kind of consider in our daily lives as we're going about perhaps our, our work that we are, might be paid to do, uh, or all of our activity to sort of thinking about it in terms of labor, I think is actually like a very powerful and just sort of interesting shift in terms of taking it out of the kind of more mystical side of it and the real material basic reality of it. Um, so just as a kind of interesting example, the doing, the deed, work, uh, building, the, the original word, it's like from Sanskrit also has this, and karoti is another, has the word of weaving, right? So this idea of like uh, that the vocation of weaving has its own word, I'll, I'll find it in here, that's rooted in the word kama. Um, Plowing is kamakasa. Kamani is just occupation, profession, kamana, profession. Uh, vanija kama is your trade. Uh, malakam, malakama is making of garlands, right? Rosaries, you know, like Anguli Mala, right? Had this rosary. Malakama is, the, is just the, the occupation or the activity of making rosaries. Um, making garlands. Latakama is uh, maybe more of like a lay with your vines and stuff like that, that you're weaving vines together. Uh, that's the work of Latakama. Anjali Kama is veneration, right? The act of venerating, the work of honoring. Uh, Kamakara is a work like a, a worker kamakarana working labor service uh akama lazy kamagaru bent on work uh there were some other sort of fun ones here Katakama, the work done by thieves. Uposata kama, the work of observing Sabbath. Nawakama, renovating, repairing, right? The work of patching something up. There were a couple more I wanted to mention. If I can find them. Hmm. 
Okay, there are more that are related to other things I'll talk about, but um, Kama Arama, delighting in work. Kama Aramata, taking pleasure in worldly activity. So this idea of um, labor as Kama is um, something so powerful in terms of like taking again out of like this kind of like the mystical and into the mundane and and the relationship of of yes this the 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 kind of buddhist framework around the more mystical side of it where the idea of like there is not such a clear distinction between um the impulse the action and the result right or the the doer and the deed, or the doer and the deed and the result of the deed. You know, there are places where the Buddha says, when I say kama, I mean intention, right? So this idea that like, there's so much involved in the volitional impulse to act, in the doing of the deed, the the fact of the deed, the the activity itself, and then the results of the deed that are so deeply intertwined um, in such beautiful ways that I think is just important to to f- kind of integrate more and more into our practice. One of the words they talk about is kamena. Right, which is again based on kama, but it's it's the sense of our character that develops through repeated action. So this idea that we are we are building, we are weaving, we are cultivating ourselves, we are crafting ourselves, we are building ourselves um, and our character uh, through you know this sort of like repetitive action. And what a powerful notion that is that the Buddha, of course, talks so much about in terms of our ability to have some influence over that, to, to recognize these sort of qualities of character, these tendencies and patterns of mind, of behavior, and to be able to have some influence, right? Be able to, through mindfulness, through observation, be able to um, start to see these patterns and take responsibility for them. Kamatana is a word that means meditation, basically. In Burma, you'll see kama, uh, the, the, the monks and nuns who are meditation masters or teachers, they're called kamatana charya. So this idea as, of the object as med, of meditation as kamatana. Um, so this sense of work, right, that's so important and so valuable. I've, you know, read in other places at times this, you know, the story of uh, Kasi Bharavaja, the plowman uh, who, you know, owns fields and works these fields and has his workers who are working the fields and the Buddha comes up for his uh, alms, daily alms round to the side of the field as the laborers are all having their lunch. And Kasi Bharadvaja is like, you know, just dismisses him. He's like, we're, uh, you know, we're all working. And, and so therefore we eat, you know, if I don't see you working, you know, where's your, where's your plow? Where's the work that you're doing? And uh, do I have it? He says, I contemplative plow and sow. Having plowed and sown, I eat. You too contemplative should plow and sow having plowed and sown, you will eat. And the Buddha responds, I too, Brahman, plow and sow, having plowed and sown, I eat. But contemplative, we don't see Master Gotama's yoke or plow, plowshare, goad, or oxen. And yet Master Gotama says this, I too, I too, Brahman, plow and sow, having plowed and sown, I eat. So Kasi Bharad Bhaja addressed the Blessed One in verse, you claim to be a plowman, but we don't see your plowing. Being asked, tell us about your plowing so that we may know about your plowing. You can hear the sarcasm. Conviction is my seed, austerity my rain, discernment my yoke and plow, moral shame my pole, mind my yoke tie, Mindfulness, my plowshare and goad. Guarded in body, guarded in speech, restrained in the requisites, 
I make truth the weed cutter and composure my unyoking. Persistence, my beast of burden, bearing me toward rest from the yoke, takes me without turning back to where, having gone, one doesn't grieve. That's how my plowing is plowed, so has as its fruit the deathless. Having plowed this plowing, one is unyoked from all suffering and stress. And so the, this kind of beautiful offering of the Buddha that recognizes that practice is work, right? That they're like very real work and very difficult work and requires, you know, so many very powerful forces of mind, you know, um, to work the, till this field of, of being, right? Um, of the body and the mind to, to liberate ourselves, but also this sense of uh, work that results in the end of work versus the work of the world that produces more work, right? That's always conjuring more responsibility, more kama, uh, that the kama of this work, the labor of spiritual practice is one that leads to the end of work, right? To the unbinding, the kamakaya is the, um, the annihilation of becoming, right, of new work, which is a synonym for arahantship, full enlightenment, right? The end of work, the end of labor, the end of um, volitional generative activity, right? It doesn't mean death, and it doesn't mean the end of existence. You know, the Buddha was very careful to kind of avoid landing in any one place with the language around, you know, does he continue to be, does he stop continuing to be, you know, after the death of the body? It's like, it's, it's this sense of kind of a beyondness. And, but this, this idea of also like putting down the work, putting down the pole and rod, right? This, this rest from the constant conjuring of ourselves, which is ultimately what this, this kind of work undoes, right? It's the work of uh, unbinding from the belief in self, from the fixation on ownership, from meanness, and from the, the fragility and anxiety that is at the heart of the mental qualities that keep conjuring those things and keep reproducing them. Right, that the work of the world, Kamaloka. In the Buddha, here's a few Kama quotes. One becomes a thief by action. Here's we'll say Kama. By action, one becomes a soldier. One becomes a priest by action. By action, one becomes king. So that is how the wise see action as it really is. Seers of dependent origination, skilled in action and result. By action, the world goes around. By action, the population goes around. Sentient beings are fastened by their action, which is like the linchpin of a moving chariot. And what is it if we think about the translation as work or labor, right? By labor, the world goes around. By labor, the population goes around. Sentient beings are fastened by their labor, like the linchpin of a moving chariot. Of labor, I am constituted. Labor is my inheritance. Labor is the matrix. Labor is my kinsman. Labor is my refuge. Whatever labor I perform, be it good or bad, to that I shall be heir. This must be reflected upon again and again by one who has gone forth. Students, beings are owners of their labor, heirs to their labor. They originate from their labor. 
they are bound to their labor, have their actions, their labor as their refuge. It is labor that distinguishes beings as inferior and superior. And so while there is this idea of the labor that ends uh, all suffering, right? The work, the action, the activity, um, the kama that unbinds kama, right? That that stops kama. There is also the knowing of our of the moral consequences of kama of of the actions that we partake in, in which yes, there might be identification, there might be um, wholesome or unwholesome roots to the motivation of those things. And how you know fundamentally important those are in terms of the practice path, that 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 actually in in order to achieve the sort of insights that uh, are the result in the dismantling and the stability of mind that results in the dismantling of the the letting go of the need to be constructing ourselves to be building ourselves all the time. Uh, to be fixated on things and controlling of things, that there is the work of creating good action and doing good in our lives and wholesome uh, beneficial action. And the, you know, reticence and carefulness and moral dread of doing actions that are harmful, right, that create suffering for ourselves or others. And, you know, of course, these are fundamental also in the tradition This idea, this word, I found, I love it. Kama patisarana. Kama patisarana. Having action as our refuge or as our protector. Right? I've seen the English of that. Right? Kama is, kama is my kinsman. Kama is my matrix. Kama is the refuge. But really this idea of our actions as our refuge. Uh, kama patisarana. What a beautiful um, notion. Kama bandhu, this idea of uh, kamasaka, kama bandhu, it means as kama is our, our relative, right? Our relation. Something we're so closely bound to. Right? The ground of actions. So, of course, the the beauty in our work that is rooted in goodness and and intended to create goodness and wishing the goodness and the wellness of others as its as its core as its source and the beautiful ways and the powerful ways and the mysterious ways that we can as we're doing good actions, as we try our best to refrain from that which is harmful and, and engage in that which is beautiful and kind and generous and loving and patient and tender and all of these things, this sense of the, the intention, the doer, the deed, the result, right? It's not quite the classical formulation, but there's like the doer and the deed or the action and the result. But this idea of like, of course, if there is no doer ultimately, and that it really is a volitional moment that leads towards an action, what is this dynamic that we create? And and so it's the, the doing of it and the engaging of it, but also the experience of it. It's like, what, what, can we also investigate, you know, can we take that charge of being interested in where is there a sense of meanness in the, in the doing, even of that which is good, right? Where is the, what is the relationship experientially in terms of the, the, the volition, the intention, the sense of me, the action itself and the consequences of that action. You know, where, where is the responsibility for action? Where does the benefit lie in action, in labor, in our doing, in our work? And to really think about all of our 
daily activity as comma, right, as labor. So whether that's work formally, you know, in terms of when you're at a job or when you're doing work that is, you know, paid for by someone else, is there this sense of like, what is it, what would it mean to, as you're doing it in your day of work, uh, propose it as comma, <laughs> right? And to, to relate to it in that way. And, and how does that change or shift or not our experience of that work, right? So the, the, the actual sense of our work being our comma, our job, our vocation, our occupation, our labor. And then of course, this idea of all of our activity, physical activity, verbal activity, and mental activity as being labor, as being that which is having an impact, that which creates, that which is action, right? And that has an, it has an effect. And the sense of where do we feel a sense of ownership of the action? Where do we sense responsibility? Where do we have an experience or not of the impact of that? internally right in our own bodies and mind where can we witness the impact externally and what are the relationships of those experiences and really taking into account the the power of our position and our the possibility of um of growth through deepening responsibility and understanding. The grosser actions, I think it's, you know, of course, any people who are on the path and have a sense of moral activity, it's not hard. It doesn't require a lot to explain that our physical gestures and actions have an impact in the world. And there's a moral character much of the time to the result of that. And our vo our verbal actions, our um, our speech, right, and the impact that that has on ourselves and those around us. It is also, I think, important to recognize mental activity as labor, as work, as endeavoring. That it's on one hand something we're generating; on the other hand, it's something that we're subject to, right? So that there is this way that we are the we are the owner and the worker, right? We are we are the, the responsible for and the beneficiary of the this mental volitional experience as well, and that that is complicated, and that we have to be careful with like being too hard around judging ourselves and and putting too much pressure on like, well, don't have bad thoughts and you should only have good thoughts or kind of whatever that might be um, in terms of self-judgment. On the other hand, if we have some sense that a lot of the stream of experience of mind experience that's happening is generated in the past that we can't quite fathom or see the source of. It's, if people go on retreat, it's not rare to get a sense of like this random, kind of just torrent of phenomena in the mind, visual, thought, emotional, that doesn't necessarily feel like we're generating it right in this moment. And that there has to be some place where we might appreciate the sense that comma is not only generated and received immediately, that there is past comma, there's past action that is coming to fruition now, that's mental volitional in nature. And so that we are in this very powerful place of receiving that and then having to manage that, right? It has pleasant, unpleasant, neutral characteristics. And those characteristics are ones that are gonna be evocative for us in different ways in the mind. And that we are at this incredible kind of fulcrum point of responsibility and power over how we relate to the activity of the mind. So to be careful about being overly judgmental or overly kind of responsible, identified with responsibility as me and mine in the experience of present moment thought, but that there is a sense of we have such power and capacity to intervene, to stop certain flows of experience, to keep other flows of experience going, and that the moral quality, the 
the ability to discern what's happening in those is very difficult work, but very powerful and important work. And so when we, we find ourselves flooded with, you know, what can feel like unwholesome or uh, unpleasant mental experience, whether it's anger, judgmental, violent, um, or just things that we feel like we don't want to be subject to, right? Things that feel anxiety or um, overwhelming, you know, uh, fantasy, um, uh, attachment, right? Things like that. This sense of like, oh, like feeling also the pain and the exhaustion of it. That there is this place of examining like this as work, as labor, and this sense of like whether it is the volitional moment, the deed itself of the thought, or the consequences of that, not always needing to feel like that there is this discernible differentiation there, but that we see it as kama. And we intervene in any way we can in relationship to it as patience, as gentleness, trying our best to bring what we see as wholesome, beneficial qualities um, to what's happening in the mind stream. And also getting that that's very difficult. It's very, uh, it's very subtle. It's very, um, fast <laughs> how the mind stream you know and so that we don't like want to put so much pressure on ourselves that it creates more tension and aversion but to know that this is possible to know that this is um the work that we are doing and that we are capable of it and that the mind is capable of this degree of subtlety and sophistication and power um to change to transform to witness of certain momentum of action and be able to transform it into something more beautiful, more wholesome, more healthy, or that through the witnessing, it comes to an end, right? It disintegrates, it dismantles. And then whatever choice we then make is new, fresh, coming out of a place where we are not identified, where we're not fixated on me and mine and ownership and, uh, fear and anxiety right that that when the mind is quiet enough and action comes to an end that that's a very powerful place to then decide to make activity happen right to to generate kama to create something new um, from that place of quietude And maybe I will just say finally that like metta is, especially in these days, I am finding with, you know, so much in the world that seems so challenging and difficult. And I mean, you've heard us say it so many times in our d direct experiences, in the news, in our fantasies about the world and where we're headed the power of metta to change the direction and change the channel is just um, unfathomable. It's amazing. And the more we dig that, you know, the more we, we labor to dig that channel and, and carve that path, the more sanctuary it is for the mind, right? The more beautiful, uh, a home and, and restful place and that that is good that is kama right the 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 mental the volitional activity of love and kindness is kama it is labor it is action and it has impact that we benefit from and that has impact in the world um and that it's so important and i know i've gone on a little but i do actually want to um michelle you think we have time for to do the metta chant? I can't, you're, un, you're muted there. I would end with it. Yeah, that's what yeah. we're, the ending is upon us. Well, it's not yet. <laughs> yeah. We'll take some oh, questions. Oh, you mean the end of the questions. Okay, yeah. great. Yeah. <laughs> that sounds great. Yeah. So um, we will take some, some questions and we can end with the uh, uh, chanting of the metta sutta can do together.
And just as a reminder, the if you want to ask a question, the easiest way is at the bottom of your Zoom screen, there's a little reactions button that should have a raise hand. And if it doesn't work, you can just type into the chat that you have a question. I'll call on you. Agda? Oh, okay. So also, hey, Agda, are you trying to get on too? So she's second. Yeah. Okay. I can't hear you. Okay, I think I'm unmuted. Yeah. Thank you, Jesse. This I was really interested in this because I was so struck by Michelle saying last week in her Dharma talk that we are all here sharing the same karma in this election cycle. I mean, it was part of the context I took. It was the, you know, the, the election cycle, the stress of what we're going through, um, but that we're sharing that karma together. And then I heard you say, Jesse, today, um, at karma as refuge. Did I hear that correctly? So when the, your last comments really opened up for me that if, if the intention is, if the intention comes from metta, then karma can be refuge. But could you talk a little bit more about that? Um, about what you were what you were meaning with that? It was just so intriguing to me. Do you want me to start, Michelle? Yeah, I mean, I think you're exactly right. This idea that that action generated by beautiful qualities is considered a refuge, you know, absolutely. And that the sense that we can take refuge in our goodness, we can take refuge in the goodness of others, right? And that that, that goodness maybe has a, a general form, but it has an active form, right? That it actually is not just goodness in a sort of abstraction, but that it's, 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 literal material um generated right through action um and that that action can be mental action it can be verbal action it can be physical action but that it all counts as as um uh wholesome refuge and that that is a, at least covers a lot of what is even considered in the when we talk about the three refuges, you know, of the Buddha, the Dhamma, the Sangha, when you look at some of those practices, you know, a lot of it is about taking refuge in the moral quality of the community and the the goodness of the actions, which isn't to say that there might not be some immoral qualities in, in the community, but the sense that we can identify the goodness there and take refuge in the goodness, right? Or of the Buddha's actions and his, you know, it gets into sort of somewhat more kind of like religious kind of constructs, right? Um, but that absolutely is a sense of where we find refuge. And and when we go on retreat and we take the precepts of non-harming, you know, um, re refraining from, you know, all these potentially difficult, harmful ac actions, again, the intention there is that, you know, throughout our time as yogis, or just as lay people in our lives that that we can take refuge in our own goodness right that we're reminded that you know for this period of time i've refrained from harming other living beings and that there is a goodness in that that is like a ground to stand on because without it we can fall into spirals of doubt right we can be haunted by times where we've been less skillful um, and the buddha really was very careful to warn against that there is a value to recognizing the consequences of harmful action in ourselves but at the same time it's not it's not helpful to kind of get into a spiral of it so yeah the sense of being able to to find grounding to find refuge um as, or as a protection is really you know it's important and it's throughout all of the you know the jataka tales and throughout the the canon for sure Michelle, you wanna, yeah. Uh, you and your mic is. Yeah. Um, 
you know, the, the, when you think about the opposite of refuge, you know, what that might mean to each of us individually, I think um, the sense that the, the acceptance of the three characteristics of existence, for example, of that we're born into anicca, dukkha, anatta. Yeah, that 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 sense of oppression uh, that we're born into, and the possibility of um, the ending of oppression. So the the possibility of total freedom versus total oppression. You know, this is. Um, to think of the karma of practice of the practice as being refuge because it will end all suffering is um, to see that as refuge, I think is very powerful to have the sense that we have a choice every moment of being oppressed or not by how we relate to experience that that this is a very deep teaching. So the way Jesse presented it where it includes all all, all <laughs> action and what's appearing in the mind, body, heart, that, that to see that what the Buddha was pointing at was that we have the responsibility of responding with choice versus with aversion, you know, greed, hatred, delusion. I think this is um, extraordinary, really, to even get a taste of prison versus refuge. <laughs> safety versus not being safe at all. Really helps in terms of uh, putting comment into a different perspective for me. Yeah. Because of course, my approach to comma was really shaped by you did something bad, it's going to come <laughs> get you later. <laughs> and so, um, and so the, um, I'm still, I, I, I think I was still in the thrall of that definition. So I really need different ways of thinking about comma. I need different, because I certainly understand the connection between the practice of a loving heart and the refuge that that can bring for not just me, but for people around me. I mean, it's, I, I, I do, get that but it just it's been so interesting to reframe comma for me so i i thank you i appreciate this very much that's great and i'll put in oh michelle i just first. have one little addition yeah. to that whereas because we have to understand about ourselves that most of our training has been um punishment and blame so that 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 sense of um, I remember with the Brahma Vihara, the Upeka Brahma Vihara, when I received a, the phrase to do for the Kamasaka was, um, but I'm going to exaggerate here because I want you to kind of get like how you could take it, which is um, you are the owner of your actions, your happiness and your sorrow depend upon your actions, not upon my wishes for you, right? Like that's how with a with a heritage of um, punishment and blame and guilt and all the knots of oppression that we have a almost a somewhat of a collective karma to live through, then that's the untangling itself. The untangling of that. When I was doing that phrase, I, you know, I had to drop the phrase because it was becoming too entangled. I had to shift to, you know, Steve offered me the phrase, things are as they are, things are just as they are. And it was like, oh, <laughs> that's great, right? You know, so like it's however we learn how to um, untangle the karma of the belief systems we've inherited as, as part, of, part of this. It's important. Thank you. Yeah. And I just want to just say quickly the <laughs> thing because I feel like I realize also you started with this question of collective comma, and to say that I don't know anywhere in the suttas where that's like elaborated upon or even acknowledged, you know. Um, 
but it is in other traditions, you know, Michelle will read often from um, Sri Nizagardara Maharaj, and, you know, he'll talk about that. And I think what, to me, that the, 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 the reality of it is like so obvious that it's not necessary to illuminate in terms of spiritual mechanics, that we are all responsible for the creation of this world in our way. And we've, we, we've landed here in whatever form, you know, not having created it directly, but that we are responsible and we share some peace in what we are generating collectively is feels for sure, you know, even if it's not necessarily part of like the, the Buddhist kind of framework that seems it doesn't, it doesn't need to be right to know that like we all have our place in the, in the puzzle. Yeah. And I did want to just add, not everyone loves looking at like the Pali English dictionary, but the a little link I just put in the chat is like the, the entry for a comma and, you know, kind of like a interesting rabbit hole. <laughs> um, so I was Magda and then I don't know if Julia, if you still have a question and then Kay. So we'll see, let's see Magda. Okay. Oh, I, I just want to say, can you hear me? Okay. Um, I've been away from the Sunday sittings for a few weeks. So coming back to this, it's like a breath of fresh air. And also, I, I was just so touched by your introduction, Jesse, to the whole talk. Like the talk was wonderful. The introduction itself, I just found so inspiring and I just can't believe how lucky I am to have fallen in with a bunch of people like you guys who have so much it feels like you have so much integrity and anyway I just want to be like you guys <laughs> I know I know I know okay, that's all I want to say okay thank you we are lucky it's it is like and that's the thing it's like to wreck like the goodness of of what we are all creating is so good and it's it's important to feel like we can honor that for sure yeah yeah it's my job michelle and um that's what i mean by collective karma that what i mean by it is that we're born and live at the same time together and some of us are with each other more than others, but like we're born, whether it's a dog or a tree or a cat, or we're born and we're living at this time together and living out our karma together. That's what I mean by collective yeah. karma. Yeah. Yeah. So it's a, um, it's good. It's good fortune. <laughs> <laughs> Even when it seems like hard, hard fortune, sometimes it's uh, powerful. Julia, did you have a question or does it? I did, and thanks for noticing. But then I decided it doesn't need to be asked because there are probably other people with questions that will benefit the whole group rather than just me thinking I had a cool thought. So <laughs> thanks for noticing. Thanks for a good talk. OK. OK. Um, yeah, I think I definitely feel motivated to act from interest in Mitta. And also there is part that, oh my God, thank God, like I, I, I am, oh, there's a like less harm in, in the world for, from certain action what I'm doing or what other people are doing that's great and and I not struggle but I always I usually come to the point that oh like yes like there's a momentary like uh, interest in energy and desire and desire to do less harm and right away there's like the identification to that pleasantness of it and like and then it becomes uh, like putting down unwholesome actions um 
and then it becomes a whole other I feel like the like it, there's a jump that happens uh which is interesting to me because I don't think I can like get away with this anyway <laughs> um, um yeah and and often about comma and wholesome action um it's commented on you know not doing much of a harm doing more of wholesome action and you're not saying that but like every time I hear hear this I'm like in the back of my head I was like putting down the unwholesome action like there there is a hierarchy happening and I think it's interesting and if you talk about um wholesome action I don't know what I'm asking I think I have a Michelle do you want to start do you want to yeah I think I um I think it sounds great and I, and I, because it's rooted in like watching, <laughs> you know, what we all experience is like how fragile a moment of insight is in terms of its sort of stability and it's in its, our sense of stability in it. And so it's like something becomes clear around action and around good goodness and wholesomeness and like doing something. And then it's such so quickly, this process of identification happens, which is how I a little bit would describe kind of what you're saying, right? It's like, oh, I'm good for this goodness. And it, the, if I were to have done something or the people who do this other thing are bad or, you know, like it, like the proliferation that generates through like, and so what's, what's so always challenging about our practice is that just because that happens, the judgment and the identification and it doesn't mean that there wasn't a genuine moment of insight but it's like what you're seeing is exactly what's so hard about the human condition is the moment of insight is real but the the habit of mind and the 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 tendency to find more security in identification and judgment is like much stronger <laughs> and so that that is like a, like the 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 pattern that the mind slips into so quickly you know uh or doubt or all of the hindrances all of these things and so i would say that it's probably in my view it feels very similar to what you're describing around wholesome and the framing of wholesome and unwholesome action which i think there is more nuance than that in in the tradition for sure um or places where you know for example this idea that like a, that that a, an enlightened person doesn't create good or bad comma right that like it's something more basically stops getting produced um but there's also something that the buddha was very clear on and of like that there are moral actions and there are immoral <laughs> actions and that 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 doesn't mean that is different than the process of mental identification and judgment that happens around self and other around inferiority and, and um, superiority that is like happens with this sort of way of conjuring ourselves that you can have a acknowledgement of like harmful action or beautiful action that isn't generating a uh, a sense of superiority inferiority those are not necessarily the same process right so that it's not the fault of the fact that there might be harmful action or beneficial action the the, the bifurcation of that is not to blame for our sense of superiority or inferiority they're really different processes but that that's going to be the material by which we are developing our inferior sense of inferiority or superiority you know does that make sense? And I don't know, does it resonate? I, I'm going to ponder on that. <laughs> um, it's, yes, I, I think there is a, mm, 
it's not a different realm, but I, I think there there is a things that uh, I can't think on this, not the higher or lower level, but like same plane um, and separate, but I have to think of it in the, as a whole thing. Um, that's what it I guess I would offer, but I'm not sure it's helpful at all. But I think that what's hard is Anicca in terms of paying attention to this in our own heart and mind. And so to have a genuine moment of wishing no harm or metta and to be motivated by that. And then a few seconds <laughs> later <laughs> to be seeing a very different like motivation that doesn't minimize it doesn't minify the minimize the genuineness of what had happened it's and in fact i think it's um really helpful in terms of how we relate to ourselves and everybody because if we lock into somebody's behavior um that might be motivated by fear as then their behavior is motivated by that and then we think that's a bad person that is not what the Buddha taught. Or like that maybe we had a, some action motivated by uh, metta and then I'm a good person, right? Like that's the, the place where, again, we have so much training around this, so much conditioning that it's it's like great that you see it, that you talked about it, that you asked about it because it's, there's a tendency for us all to want to kind of lock into things that make it more secure. Like then therefore I'm always a good person <laughs> or like that's always a bad person. And it makes us feel like more secure, but actually it's much, Anicca is much more in an Anatta. Like it's all very much like just who am I? Who are you? They're just different moments where so we're motivated by greed, hatred, and delusion or by the Brahma Viharas or wisdom. And it's just very um, much more, it's much less solid than what we've been taught about this is a good person. This is a good family. This is a good family for the last 400 years in this village and this is a very bad family that's been in the village for 400 years we see how that like just locks in and is so oppressive and then on the other hand what i think what you and jesse are really pointing at is that actually the intention to have <laughs> um to see the the greed hatred and delusion to see that and to have a choice not to say I'm a bad person for it or you're a bad person for it, but actually to say um, we don't have to be oppressed by that. We have a choice, right? I think that's what I got from what you said, Kay, that you had a choice and that that was really, that's a victorious. And then you saw the, you saw the kind of coming down the, and that you saw that you saw that. Neither which of them are your, you. <laughs> That's what's so fun. Yeah, it's great. And I, I always forget that that happened. Like the moment of like really genuine part happened. I, I feel like the anything that after that, that coming down will diminish it. Um, And also how fast that goes. And I can see that in retreat, if not here, but yeah. then. <laughs> yeah. Then I can see that maybe I see this person who usually act from fear that it's very obvious. Then maybe they had intention moments of meta and turn into fear. Like I, who knows? I will never know um, that <laughs> <laughs> because I barely know myself. <laughs> you know what's happening in here? But um, yeah, it's it's. But I think it's. Yeah, it's a great point that I need to remember that yeah. both are happening and most things are happening and rising, passing away. Yeah, thank you. I think also that 
kind of Michelle where, where you started a while ago in a, in a different question it's just it's always this is part of what is so hard about just the notion of morality is that for so many of us and maybe you could say all of us but in different ways and in different degrees the notion of good and bad has been used against us through for our whole lives right and maybe for many generations and for and and so that that bifurcation the tendency to sort of do that of like there's good action there's bad action and and then like the, then if you get into the subtlety of like oh there's good people and bad people and like what makes that and is that inherent and is that like all of the places where those we so much of what we're trying to unwind from our and in our own minds hearts and bodies is from the kind of oppressiveness of that kind of you know matrix it's like it's just tricky material that's all it's like very, it's complicated to try to get into that and be like oh there's good i'm good it's like ugh. and so <laughs> and so maybe there is that place where it's like okay love like meta like just rather than sort of like the being being sensitive to what you are around like oh god this like this mechanism is alive in me right of of judgment and of inferior superior it's like no matter what meta is like a good answer right it's like loving kindness loving kind of, you know trying to just like attune to that flavor of mind whether it's superiority inferiority judgment trauma whatever the sort of like reality of it is it's like loving kindness is an appropriate response and that we don't some part of us can kind of get out of the <sighs> judgmental tendency of that kind of process and going towards just like caring, you know, caring or compassion. Yeah. Kristen. I'd, I'd just like to mention that um, sometimes a misunderstanding of karma is we receive it in the context of of the Buddhist practice. Uh, and it was a long time ago, but when I was at the three month retreat, there was um, an older, well-respected teacher. And I was in a group interview with him and uh, a woman in the group mentioned that um, she had been sexually abused by her father and the teacher said, well, you were abused by your father because you abused in a past life. So, Do you want to respond? Or can I, I um, is there any more, Kristen? Am I jumping in too quickly? No, no, that's, that? that's fine. So who was that? Yeah. Never mind. Ah, <laughs> yeah. um, uh, you know, I would say, you know, this is one of my great pet peeves. You know, if you see teachers, you start to see their blood boil. This is one of them. Um, this is the whole framework of punishment and blame that is, it's so upsetting in terms of like um, perpetuating that. It's, it's, um, it is when I do appreciate the sense of karma is unfathomable and that um, and that I tend to really try to step out of punishment and blame, maybe to a fault, but I, I do feel like um, uh, uh, it's to me that the way you what was said is like kicking a horse when it's down. It's like um, so unnecessary to add in on top of abuse that you know, uh, it's your fault. It's, it's so um, gross and such a misunderstanding of how to teach about comma even. So if you take everything out of like that kind of realm and you say again, if you're, if you're born human, 
but if you're born a cat, if you're born an ant, if you're born a dolphin, right, you, you kind of get that there's these different levels of existence and that in these realms, if you're not protected, you're going to hurt, receive some horrible stuff. And um, so there is a level of that if you're born human, there are um, all kinds of ways that we're hurt and we harm. And so to kind of keep it on that level of um, trying to understand the levels of pain and pleasure and joy and sorrow and confusion and doubt and delusion that that to make it into something that um, unnuanced, unnuanced, a brushstroke as in a response, especially in a group, um, I think is just a misunderstanding of karma and how you would help somebody understand it, you know. So um, I think, it, again, I, I, I get, so um, if you're born human, <laughs> there's a mix of karma so that you will have some pleasure, you'll have pain, and you'll have neutral. It's like, um, why can't that be good enough? An answer. And really, it's like, then if you try to help us understand, really, to me, it's like, what happened to my father? What happened to his, his father? What really happened so that they turned out to have these particular actions, which is a mix of karma, right? It's like, and I know, Kristen, you know this. It's like, there's such a mix of karma in our immediate relatives, never mind um, broader. Um, but, but it's to be born, to be born and to face, uh, this unfolding of karma. It's, it's enough for each of us to just get, uh, it's a mix. That, that, that's to me where we need to go with all of us and, uh, to try to, help is help ourselves and the best and others like if there is a, it's obvious that some people have harsher harsher karma then of course we'd want to help them not blame them <laughs> hmm. that's how yeah if you're born in burma right now it's not a picnic it's obvious that there's some hard karma going on but it's like to to try to source it to somebody's parent it just it, you, it doesn't cut the mustard it's too, it's too much it's lifetimes it's vast it's like looking out at the ocean and trying to find a look at one wave and say well where did what this wave's parent like what karma did that wave have it, it's it's crazy it's it's actually i consider it insane The Buddha once said, comparing is madness. I would say that, that uh, that's like answering with an ax. So, okay, I'm sorry if it sounds like a pet peeve, but it is my pet peeve, so. <laughs> Mine too. <laughs> and, you know, again, clearly, mm -hmm. if we... If we're motivated by metta rather than rage, it's going to have a different effect. That's good enough to 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 paying attention to that is where where we try to help people understand. You know. Anyway, Jesse, do you have a un pet peeve answer? Uh, no. <laughs> a non pet peeve. Answer. I, mean, I think I, I just I do I totally agree obviously and and that uh, I think anyone that would propose to know th 
the nature of comment and detail at this point. I just don't, I just, I just think it's ridiculous. It's ridiculous to presume. I think that there are things that you're going to find in the scriptures and in the text that will, that are not, it's like why you have to have a kind of discerning attitude towards everything around the tradition, you know, where it's like you can respect so much of it, but also hold a lot of things that are, um, that have so much potential to cause so much harm at like really at arm, you know, it was like a, I don't know what's quite the word word grain of salt or arm's length or, or just like very skeptically, you know, who knows what, who knows rebirth or anything, but what you can know is like what's motivating your action right now. And what are the consequences of that in the next moment and into the world around you. And that's what partly what I'm trying to kind of emphasize around like getting out of the concept of comma as like, Oh, blah, 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 where we can just think about it all the time. And, and be seduced by it or be upset by it <clears throat> versus like it's labor it's like work and this is the nature of it in this moment and we can observe it and we can take responsibility for it and the i would say so much of what the the way the buddha taught was designed to be inspiring and lead towards like inspiration and non-personal non-identification right including stuff with comma so whatever all the stuff that you'll see around comma in the suttas that some of it has more of that flavor of like punishment and stuff like that where it's like it's like trying to be inspiring and trying to be like it's not personal really on this deep level but the through the patriarchal system in the theravada buddhist context and history through our own yes that it ends up being sort of more like demeaning and degrading and and self creating you know and so it's just like there's not a lot of value in thinking about it and it's it's really point it's really painful to hear that like in the context of a retreat where someone was feeling vulnerable and safe enough to like share something in a group context right that it would be the acts would come out in this way that's like you know it's like who who is that helpful for you know yeah. I'm um I'm sorry you even had to hear it, Kristen. <laughs> he went on to say that that kind of thing doesn't happen in India. Right. All right. There you go. Okay. Well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that must have been really inspiring. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Oh yeah, well, those um those delusions are starting to get seen through, thankfully. Yeah, so deluded. It was a long time ago, so right. there's been some progress. Right. Thank you. Mm. Well, Michelle, do you think it would be good to end with the the meta chant? The chant? Or, yeah, I know it's a little. It's, it's, a, it's little a little long, late. but if anybody we'll needs it. to, yeah, let's do it. It's that would be. I think the world needs it as well as us, so let's do it. Okay, let me. Um, we'll just do it because it's it is a little long. We'll just chant it in Pali, and for folks who wanna look it up, I'll set, put a link in the in the in the chat a little at the end. And Michelle, should you and I just do call and response or do we want to do the crazy call and response with everyone? I can't hear you. Uh, until we do it a few times, I think maybe call and response might okay. be good. Yeah. For you and I, but that's what I'm yeah. saying. Yeah, yeah, let's do it yeah, that way. Cause okay. I think it, it might, until people know enough people know it uh, some people know it but not everybody i can see that when sounds I great about so that. you and i michelle and feel free okay. others can be it stay muted and do it uh yeah response in your home <clears throat>
how about I do it and then you respond? Oh, right. Is that the idea? Okay. Karaniyam Atakusalena. Karaniyam Atakusalena. Yantam Santam Padam Abhisamecha. Yantam Santam Padam Abhisamecha. Sako Ujucha Sujucha. Sako Ujucha Sujucha. Suato Chasa Mudu Anatimani. Suato Chasa Mudu Anatimani. Santu Sakocha Subarocha. Santu Sakocha Subarocha. Apa kicho cha salau kauti. Apa kicho cha salau kauti. Santindrio cha nipakocha. Santindrio cha nipakocha. Apa gabo kule su ananugido. Apa gabo kule su ananugido. Nacha kudam samachare kinchi. Nacha kudam samachare kinchi. Jena win you pare upawadeum. Jena ibin you pare upawadeum. Sukino wa kemino hontu. Sukino wa kemino hontu. Sabe sata bawantu sukitata. Sabe sata bawantu sukitata. Ye kechi panabutati. Ye kechi panabutati. Tasawa tawarawa anawasesa. Tasawa tawarawa anawasesa. Digawa Jehemantawa Digawa Jehemantawa Majima Rasakanu Katula Majima Rasakanu Katula Ditawa Jehewa Adita Ditawa Jehewa Adita Yeche dure wasanti awidure. Yeche dure wasanti awidure. Butawa sambawe siwa. Butawa sambawe siwa. Sabe sata bawantu sukitata. Sabe sata bawantu sukitata. Na paro param nikubeta. Na paro param nikubeta. Na ti manyeta katachinam kanchi. Na ti menyata katachinam kanchi. Biaro sana patiga sanya. Biaro sana patiga sanya. Nanya manya sa duka micheya. Nanya manya sa duka micheya. Mata yata niyam putam. Mata yata niyam putam. Ayusa e kaputam anurake. Ayusa e kaputam anurake. Ewampi sababu desu. E one piece ababu tesu. Mana saham bawa ye aparimanam. Mana saham bawa ye aparimanam. Metancha sabalo kasmim. Metancha sabalo kasmim. Mana saham bawa ye aparimanam. Mana sam bawa ye aparimanam. Udamado cha tiriancha. Udamado cha tiriancha. Asam badam maweram asapatam. Asam badam maweram asapatam. Titan charang nisinoa. Titan charang nisinoa. 
Saya no wa ya wata sa winga tamido. Saya no wa ya wata sa winga tamido. Etam satim aditaya. Etam satim aditaya. Brahma netam viharam idamahu. Brahma metam viharam idamahu. Ditincha anupagama silawa. Ditincha anupagama silawa. Dasane na sampano. Dasane na sampano. Kamesu winea gaydang. Kamesu winea gaydang. Nahi jatu gabasayem punaretiti. Nahi jatu gabasayam punaretiti. Apparently it's World Kindness Day. I just found that out late in the day, but you still have some hours left to share the kindness. Thank you, everybody. <laughs>